different passages. So we're going to start in Matthew chapter number 20. And uh, thank you again for coming here this morning. Y'all glad to be here this morning? It's nice and warm in the house of God. I mean, it really is. And so praise the Lord for that. And uh, hopefully your cars are warm. How many of you uh, had heat in your car on your way to church this morning? All right, good, good. And um, I know some people don't have heat because they just have problems so uh, with their um, uh, coolant and things like that. But if you had heat this morning, again, that's a blessing from the Lord. All right, Matthew chapter number 20, please. Oh, I suppose I should turn there, right, if I'm going to read from it. And um, Matthew chapter number 20. Again, we're going to use our Bibles three times this morning. So again, just keep your Bibles handy. Look at verse 29, Matthew chapter 20, and look down at verse number 29. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them because that they should hold their peace but they cried the more saying have mercy on us O Lord thou son of David and Jesus stood still and called them and said what will ye that I shall do unto you they say unto him Lord that our eyes may be opened so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Today, I want to speak to you on this topic, Follow Me, part number 21, and here's the subtitle, Because of What Jesus Did for Me. Because of What Jesus Did for Me for me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to be here this morning. Lord, I sure do love you with all of my heart, and I love these dear people, and I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to assemble together today. And Lord, please bless us now as we do assemble. Please meet with us in a very real way. Holy Spirit of God, give me your power. Dear Lord, I need the mind of Christ as well. Help me to have your mind. And I just pray, dear Lord, for every single person that's here and those who are watching online, that you'll give us all ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. And Father, please just do a work that only you can do and we'll give you all the glory now in Jesus name amen thank you Lord for a great day now today I want to talk to you about follow me part 21 because of what Jesus did for me we are going to read three stories in the gospels um, telling us about how Jesus healed some blind men they all follow Jesus after being healed and of these three stories, there are three lessons to be learned about why we also should follow Jesus because of what Jesus did for me or for us, whatever the case may be. Okay, number one, write this down. Because Jesus opened my eyes. Write that down. Number one, because Jesus opened my my eyes. Now, in the Bible, there are, there are many times where there are stories of an event or stories of something that Jesus did. And because it's in the Bible, it's not just simply an historical account of something that happened. And then you can just look at it and go, oh, wow, Jesus opened the eyes of those two blind men. There is always a spiritual application that's why it's in the bible so see it's not just some book of stories there are spiritual truths sometimes the spiritual truths are just simply stated straight out sometimes you know jesus says something or the bible is written a certain way we're like the commands you know do this don't do that and uh, how to live and what to do and 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 your attitude and you know the fruit of the spirit and how you're supposed to have the fruit of, and all of that but but in every case there are stories that are written in the bible and told about that there are spiritual 
application. So look at this carefully now in Matthew chapter number 20. These uh, blind men, a great multitude follow Jesus, all right? So there's some observations I'd like to say before we get to the main point. But it says two blind men <coughs> were sitting by the wayside. They heard that Jesus was coming, so they couldn't see him. But they hear this commotion. There's a great multitude. And remember in the Bible, whenever there was the word multitude used, it was always talking about thousands. Not dozens, not hundreds, but literally thousands. Now, we don't know how many thousands are following Jesus at this time, but there's a great multitude. And, and so it's not a small crowd. And then uh, a lot of commotion. And, and the blind men are like, who's coming by? And they said, it's Jesus. Oh, we've heard of him. He heals people and maybe he would heal us. So they start crying when they hear that Jesus is close by. They start saying, have mercy on us. O Lord, thou son of David. Now, there are people standing by or possibly walking by with the multitude in verse 31. And it says they rebuked them. They said, stop it. Don't annoy the Savior. He doesn't have time for you. Leave him alone. He's got somewhere to go. Hush your mouth. You know, that's all in the Greek. Hush your mouth. But anyway, uh, my grandma Bosmer, if she was still alive, she would have been, be still, be still. That's what she used to always tell me as, a, as a, her grandson when I was at her house. Be still, you know. But anyway, uh, they may have said, you know, shut up or hold your peace or be quiet or be still or whatever the case may be. But when they, they were told to be quiet, they cried the more. They said, we're not crying for nothing. This is Jesus, and he's a great healer, and we have an opportunity to be able to receive our sight. We're not shutting up for anybody. They cried out the more. Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Now, I love this verse in verse number 32, and it says Jesus stood still. He knew somebody was crying out to him, he was going somewhere to do something, but someone needed him. And so Jesus, he stopped. He stood still, and then he said, hey, y'all, you're calling for me. Come here. He, says, he said, he called to them. What do you want me to do? Actually, he didn't say come to me. He just called to them and said, what is it you want? And uh, they said, Lord, that we may receive, uh, my, our eyes may be open." Now, I love this point, too, in verse number 34. Look what it says. So Jesus had compassion on them. And that word compassion is an amazing word, especially when, it, when it's regards to our Savior. That word compassion definitely means he cared deeply. So he looked at these two blind men, and he genuinely cared about their well-being. The word compassion is, is more than just having feelings for. It's more than just loving someone. It is a genuine, sincere, deep care about someone's condition. And he looked at them and had compassion on them. And here's what he did. He walked over towards them. He touched their eyes. And it says immediately their eyes received sight. I mean, just like that. And, and God gave them sight. And here's what they did. They opened their eyes. They could see. And so what did they do? It says they followed him. Now, when it comes to my life, how is it that Jesus, what has he done for me? He's opened my eyes. And I want to give you three thoughts, subpoints underneath point number one, about what has Jesus opened my, my eyes to? Letter A, write this down, to the truth. He opened my eyes to the truth. Now, folks, I believe with all of my heart that truth is, is absolute it's not fluid it's not dependent on someone's liking it or not truth is not conditional based on the condition in which you find yourself truth is absolute we say what are some absolute truths two plus two is four the sun is going to rise in the east set in the west the Pope is Catholic, and the Broncos are going to come in last place. I mean, there are some absolute <laughs> truths, okay? And so, but truth, like I said, it, it, it has no bearing on someone liking it or not. It has no bearing on someone believing it or not. It has no bearing on condition. I've often told people, <laughs> the first president of the United States of America was George Washington. Now, you can believe it or not, 
but that's an historical fact and it's the truth. And, and some people can say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, whatever. But I mean, you can be honorary towards the truth if you want to, but the fact is there are truth. Now, before I came to Jesus and before all of us come to Jesus, we are genuinely lost in darkness when it comes to truth. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, two plus two equals four, that truth. What I'm talking about is two thoughts. First of all, wisdom. Secondly, reality. Most of us do not have a firm grasp on truth before we come to Jesus. You say, why is that? Well, John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Without Jesus, you're not going to really be able to understand and know what is truth. You know, before I came to Christ, you know, I was raised in a public school. I was taught evolution. I don't really, I came to Christ and got saved when I was 10 years of age. I I dedicated my life to the Lord when I was 17. So those are the two monumental moments in my life. But I'm sure there was a time that I just believed what my school teachers told me. I'm sure that there was a time I thought, yeah, evolution's true. There was a big bang billions of years ago, and from that bang and the the rocks stopping at a certain spot and rotating around another rock that was a little bit hotter than this rock, and all of a sudden life appeared, and next thing you know, we have, you know, what we have today in 20, or whatever I was when I was in school, whatever year that was, 1970s and 80s. Um, But um, the fact of the matter is, without Christ, you really cannot understand wisdom, truth reality. You see, there is truth. You know, sometimes people say, (laughs) I've had so many people say this to me, you know, whatever God you believe in, that is the truth to you. That is so idiotic to say something like that. Just because I think of a God, does that make that God real? You know, if if, if I think a tree is God, does that make that tree God? You know, sometimes, you know, and I appreciate all that the world does, you know, as far as humanitarian things. But if those of you that have ever been to AA, I mean, they have some really, you know, good things to help people overcome addictions to alcohol. And I'm not belittling any of that. But AA, from what my understanding was, is it was founded on Christian principles. That's what my understanding is, the little bit that I've looked into history of it. But it's morphed over time. And I've had people who have gone to AA and they say, pray to your higher power. And they say, well, what if I don't have a higher power? Then they say, pick something like that doorknob as your higher power. Have you ever heard something like that being stated? If you've been to AA, maybe you've heard it differently. But I've heard people say to me that whatever higher power you have, go to it and pray to it and depend upon it. And even if it's a light bulb or a doorknob. Now, A light bulb or a doorknob is kind of a silly example because it absolutely cannot be a higher power. Even if I think it is, it just cannot be. You see, truth is absolute. So guess what? When I came to Jesus, I literally found out the truth. He is the Son of God. He is real. I've often told people there's only one of three things that Jesus Christ can be. And it all starts with the letter L. He is the Lord, who he says he is. He is a liar. That means he's just flat out lying to us. Or he's a lunatic, meaning he's out of his mind. He's just a crazed guy that doesn't know what he's saying. But he has to be one of those three. He cannot be any other. I've had people tell me, I believe Jesus is a good person, but I don't believe he's the son of God. Well, you can't believe wholeheartedly that he's a good person when he said, I am the son of God. When he said, I am the way to heaven, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. When he said, all that ever came before me are liars. I'm the only one that's true. When he said those things, he is either telling the truth or he's lying or he's a lunatic. He's out of his mind. Now, if he's lying, you can't call him a good person. If he's crazy, it's kind of hard to call him a good person too because he's spouting things that don't make any sense. But if he's the Lord, then you can call him a good person. I'm so glad that God allowed me to learn the truth. And it came when Jesus touched my eyes. Wisdom, I've often told people here at this church as I preached on wisdom, wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. Wisdom is not looking at life with political correctness. 
Wisdom is not looking at life the way your family raised you. Wisdom is looking at life from God's point of view. That's what it is. Wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. Now, if your family raised you to see life from God's point of view, then it's one and the same. If the politics say what God says, then it's one and the same. But that's, has that ever happened? <laughs> I mean, come on, right? And, uh, but the fact of the matter is, there is wisdom. There is reality. You know, I've often said this. I said this. You know, people say to me th- things like this. Well, when we die, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll find out when we die. Well, I mean, obviously we will find out, but here's the thing, you can know before it happens. There is something called reality. And once you learn what reality is, that's the truth, it'll help your life so much better. So what did Jesus do to open my eyes? Letter A, he opened my eyes to the truth. Letter B, he opened my eyes to my purpose in life. To my purpose in life. You know, one of the things that I've often thought, which would be a very discouraging way to live, is for someone to say, I have no idea why I'm on this planet. I don't know what my purpose is. Now, you do have a purpose. You do. And the person that can open your eyes to your purpose is Jesus Christ. For some, it may be, you know, to raise children. Maybe God, as, as you know, parents, a mother and a father, maybe God has a reason for you to be here raising, you know, okay, I've often said this or learned about this. You can be a king or you can be a king maker. It depends on what God's purpose is for your life. You know, I look at, you know, Jack Hiles, um, uh, and I've often referenced him because he had such an impact in my life. Jack Hiles was the pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. I went to his Bible college, and he, he passed away at age 74 in 2001. He had over one million converts in his ministries as a pastor over the lifetime of his uh, ministry. There's only three um, modern-day preachers that we know about that have had a million or more converts in their services while they preached, and that was Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, and Jack Hiles. Those are the only three that, that I'm aware of. Now, there may be others but in our modern day, but, but in foreign countries and stuff, and I, I don't know about them, but I know about those that influenced America and Europe, uh, D.L. Moody and, um, and Billy Sunday and then Jack Hiles. Now, he was a great, great preacher, but guess what? He had a mother. And her name was Coistal Maddie Hiles. She had a failed marriage. Her husband was a drunk, and he, he left her. Brother Hiles had two, two siblings. <clears throat> One of them passed away at a young age, and he had a sister that lived a little bit longer than he lived. But, but their mother invested in them. And, and she couldn't do much. She, had, she, she worked a job. You know, she had to fend for herself a single mom. And, and, and plus, they were alive during the times of the Depression, you know. Um, you know, Brother Hiles uh, uh, told the story one time about how he and his mom and his sister were sitting at the table. I think it was Thanksgiving time. And there was no food on the table. And they said, and, and, and his mom said, uh, um, uh, children, let's, let's, let's give thanks now for the food that we're about to receive. And, and there was no food on the table. And after they got done praying, there was a knock on the door. And, um, and the church, someone from the church had brought a bag of groceries for them to have for a meal, you know, for the holiday. And, um, and, and so Brother Hiles' faith was greatly impacted by his mom. His mother never became a king or queen, but boy, she raised a son that accomplished so many great things. We all have different purposes to be, why are we here? You know, it could be an invention. It could be that we come up with an invention that benefits mankind. It could be that, um, you know, we have some type of um, um, asset that we bring to the table, some talent, some gift. I know some people, they're, they're here because they've got <clears throat> music abilities, not quite as good as mine, but um, mu- music um, abilities to, uh, to be able to see. <laughs> and, uh, and some people are put on this planet to bless us with the songs that they sing, the music that they sing, to, to be able to help us to praise God and, and to make us you know, feel better about our lives, whatever the case may be. But the fact of the matter is, all of us have a purpose. Who can tell us what our purpose is? 
I think it's Jesus. I remember when he touched me in uh, 1987 and he opened my eyes. Actually, 1986. I, I didn't surrender until 1987. But 1986, he touched me and said, I have put you on this planet to be a preacher. I want you to pastor a church. You know, with all of the trials and all of the difficulties and all of the circumstances of life that can kind of get a person down, knowing that I am living in the purpose for which God created me helps me to keep on going. I don't have despair. There's no reason for me to contemplate suicide. There's no reason for me to contemplate running away and just getting away because I have no idea what I'm doing here in this world. I know why I'm here. Jesus opened my eyes. I have a purpose for my existence, and Jesus helped me to find that. Number one, because Jesus opened my eyes. Letter A, to the truth. Letter B, to my purpose. Letter C, to eternity. He opened my eyes to eternity. You say, what's that? Well, eternity is basically two things. It's heaven and hell. I remember <clears throat> when Jesus opened my eyes, when it came to eternity, there literally is a place called heaven. There literally is a place called hell. And for all eternity, we're going to spend eternity in one place or the other. And folks, let Jesus open your eyes to that. Uh, I've often talked to people. Listen, this, this is funny. I've often talked to people and I said, uh, you know, when you die, do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven? And they say, no. And then I say, well, if you could know, would you like to know? And I've actually had some, some people say to me, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I've had people actually say to me, no, I think it'd be fun just to kind of wait and see. What happens? And I say to them always, I say, okay, listen. Listen to what you're saying. There is a heaven and there is a hell. They're both real. And you're going to go to one place or the other. Do you really want to go to hell? Is that okay with you if that ends up being your fate? And a lot of times, they'll, after I say that, they'll go, well, <laughs> no. And then I say, look, I, I'll say this to them. I'm not a gambling man at all. If there was a 90% chance I'd go to heaven and a 10% chance I wouldn't, it'd be my luck I'd land on that 10% chance. <laughs> so I don't want to take the chance. I said, if I could know 100% sure that I'm going to heaven and not have to worry about going to hell, that would be such a relief. Now, when I say that to them, the majority of them go, oh yeah, well, I, I, I think I, I see what you're saying. And then I get to share the gospel with them. But it's so strange to me that I've actually had people say to me in my face, being sincere, well, if I deserve to go to hell, then so be it. I guess I'll go to hell. And I don't know that I would ever want to live like that. I mean, I remember when my eyes were opened by Jesus to the fact that heaven is real and it's so wonderful and it's eternity with God and hell is real and it's so terrible. And why would anybody just say, oh, well, if I go to hell, I go to hell. I mean, really? I mean, you, I mean it, if you think hell is like annihilation, I can maybe understand that. If you think that people who go to hell, they cease to exist. They get completely annihilated and they cease to exist. I've met some people that really do struggle with actually enjoying their existence and they're miserable and they think there would be relief if I just didn't exist anymore. But that's not reality. The reality is that when people die, if they go to heaven, it's bliss, it's paradise it's wonder it's with god forever and if people go to hell it is pain and torment lake of fire darkness falling gnashing of teeth forever i mean it never ends sometimes people say to me well i just don't like that i don't believe hell's real i don't believe in that well you can believe in it or not but remember what i told you about truth in in the very beginning of this point truth is not conditioned on whether or not you like it truth is truth period the only reason the only reason well there's two reasons the main reason i said yes to jesus to become a preacher is because the hell's real hell's real and I don't want anybody to go to hell. I want to help everybody I can to be able to go to heaven. I can think of nothing better to do for mankind than to help people get to heaven. The second reason I 
surrender to be a preacher is because God said, if you don't surrender, you'll not live to see your 18th birthday. And I kind of wanted to live to see my 18th birthday. So, and, uh, but the main reason I became a preacher is because hell's real. What did Jesus do for me? He opened my eyes. That's why I'm following him. I can see today. I can see truth. I can see my purpose in life. And I can see what eternity is and what it's all about. Okay, let me give you another aspect about eternity. Yes, there's heaven. Yes, there's hell. But what's heaven for you and I? Well, the very first thing that's going to happen when we get to heaven is we're going to be judged. There is a judgment seat of Christ. That, my friend, is true. And a lot of people think, a lot of people have not had their eyes open to this fact, but a lot of people think we're all going to heaven, we're all going to get there the same way with Jesus, and it's all going to be the same for all of us when we get to heaven. There's not going to be any variations in heaven. It's just going to be the same all across the board. Now, you say, why do they feel that way? Well, I think a lot of the ways that we feel that way is, is like, you know, with that, like, welfare mentality, like the way we look at our government, you know, Everybody deserves food. Everybody deserves a place to live. Everybody deserves health care. Everybody deserves, you know, whatever. And it's the government's job to give it to us. And I think a lot of people think that way about God. When we get to heaven, everybody's going to have food. Everybody's going to have a place to sleep. Everybody's going to have health care. Everybody's going to have a job, you know, or an education, you know, free education, whatever, right? Well, that's just not the way it is. Getting to go to heaven is the same for everybody. But what happens when you get there is completely determined on how you live your life. The judgment seat of Christ is not about God revealing all your sins to you. That happened at Calvary. It's all taken care of. The judgment seat of Christ is God revealing to you how much you lived for him, what you did for him, how much you invested in eternity. And then you get rewarded for that. And then your heaven is completely determined by how you're judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the Bible does say, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. So, I mean, obviously, it's better to go to heaven by the skin of your teeth than to die and go to hell. Of course, it's better to do that. But listen, there is a judgment seat of Christ. And we will give an account for how we live our lives on that day. And I want to be able to say to Jesus, not that I'm perfect, because I can't, but I do want to be able to say to him, I followed you, and I live my life for you. Why is it that I follow Jesus? Number one, because Jesus opened my eyes, because of what he did for me. Number two, look at Mark chapter 10. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter number 10. Look down at verse number 46. Mark chapter number 10. If you're still glad to be here, say amen. All right, good job. God's good. Mark chapter 10, and look down at verse 46. We're going to read down to verse 52. Mark chapter number 10, verses 46 to 52. All right, look at verse 46. And they came to, Jer to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people um, excuse me, with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the, the, the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and, and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more. Uh, uh, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. I said, number one, you know, follow me, part 21, because of what Jesus did for me, number one, because Jesus opened my eyes, number two, write this down, because Jesus made me whole. Because Jesus 
made me whole. It says right there in verse number 52, and by the way, this is a different story than what we read in, in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 20. In Luke chapter, in Mark chapter 10, it's talking about blind Bartimaeus, and it says this, he said to Bartimaeus, go thy way, here's what he said, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, this is a different application. In, Matt, in Matthew chapter number 20, we see that Jesus said unto them, you know, he touched their eyes and they, they, they received sight. In this particular story, we see Jesus said to blind Bartimaeus, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, what does the word whole refer to? Well, I believe it refers to more than just simply giving them eyesight. He could have just said, you can see, but he didn't. He said, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, for me, why is it that I follow Jesus? Why do I follow Jesus? Because Jesus made me whole. How so? Three things. Letter A, write this down. From sin. He made me whole from sin. What does that mean? Here's what it means. You ready for this? He changed my life. I love that song. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. You know, when I came to Jesus, I did not just get salvation. He made me whole. He changed my life. I remember when I was a teenager, you know, again, there were two times I met Jesus, significant times in my life. One was for salvation in 1980. One was in 1987 when I dedicated my life to the Lord. So I'm referring to both of those situations right now. But before 1987, when I came to Jesus and dedicated my life to him, I didn't care about living for God. I I wanted to do whatever I wanted. I had my own plans, my own dreams, my own ideas for how I was going to live my life. And then I could care less about doing what was right most of the time, a lot of the time. Like, like I cussed a lot as a teenager and never around my mom. Okay, this is, let me make that clear, never around my mom. But uh, I did, I cussed a lot. And it, it, when I was 17 years of age and I gave my, my life to the Lord, uh, I haven't cussed since, except for if I say, you know, Las Vegas Raiders or something like that. Uh, Dallas Cowboys, you know, things like that. But anyway... Uh, but uh, no, I, I haven't. No, why? Because I, Jesus made me whole. I have no desire to cuss again. I, I don't understand Christians who cuss. I mean, I really, I just, I just don't understand it. There, there's this teenagers and 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 and, um, and young adults in their twenties and stuff that they just fr- freely f- throw around cuss words. I mean, just all the time. I just don't understand a Christian who loves the Lord and is following Jesus who has no problem with cussing. I just, I don't understand it. It's a filthy way to talk. And and I'm just going to tell you right now, Jesus can make you whole from that. If you come to him and like blind Bartimaeus did, and if you come to him and say, Lord, I want to follow you. Would you, would you make me whole like you did blind Bartimaeus? He can. He really can. He can make you whole from sin. He changed my, by the way, he gave me victory over sin. Listen carefully. You're never going to be sinless. You're never going to be perfect in this body and in this life. When you get to heaven, you will be. You'll be just like Jesus. You don't have a glorified body. Praise the Lord. Y'all are going to get better ears. You'll be able to appreciate my singing then. But anyway, uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, then you'll be perfect. Now you won't. But here's what, here's what God does say. I can make you whole. I can give you victory over sin. There's no sin that you commit that you have to say, I just can't do anything about this. I just can't stop. You know, I, I, I've had, and, and please don't get offended. I, I'm trying to help you this morning. Really, I, I, I say what I say because I want to help you. But in the 29 and plus years I've been pastoring, I've had so many Christians say, I just can't give up cigarettes. I just, I just can't stop smoking cigarettes. Yes, you can. If you come to Jesus, he can make you whole. You can give it up if you want to. You realize there are people in the world that give up smoking that don't even believe in Jesus. It's not like it's such a terrible addiction that it's just you can't do anything about it. God can make you whole. Whatever your sin is, whatever the sin that you struggle with, 
God can give you victory. Now, again, you're never going to get to a point where you're sinless. You're never going to get to a point where you, um, you, you, you just never do anything wrong. Obviously, you know, when you do things that are wrong, you know, and the Holy Spirit convicts you of it, and you feel guilt and remorse and shame, then you can confess and get right with God right then, right? I mean, that's how we're supposed to live our lives. First John 1, 9 says, if we, those of us who are Christians, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, it's kind of like this. You don't take a shower and then you're clean for the rest of your life. I'm never going to get dirty again. <laughs> you need to take a shower every day. Some of you, please take a shower every day. Come on, please. No, it's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it to the rest of us, all right? But anyway, the fact of the matter is, yes, you're going to sin. And yes, you go to Jesus. And yes, you ask him to forgive you. And he will. He'll cleanse you. And he'll restore whatever fellowship was broken with him. But I'm just simply saying, you don't ever have to look at sin individually and just say, I'm never going to stop smoking. I'm never going to stop cussing. I can't give up internet pornography. I can't, you know, whatever. No, you can if you come to Jesus he can make you whole. And if he makes you whole, why don't you follow him like blind Bartimaeus did? Because Jesus made me whole, letter B, from hurts. Write that down. From hurts. You know what? There's a lot of hurt that happens in life. There are trials. There are burdens. And sometimes it's people's behavior that hurt you. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Have you ever been hurt by a leader? <sighs> Spiritual or, you know, at a job or in a school or college or a parent. I mean, whatever, right? Have you ever been hurt by a leader? I, I, I know a lot of people through means of social media. I know a lot of people through experience here at, at, at church here, just meeting people for 29 plus years. People get hurt by leaders, and they never recover from it. Can I just be honest with you completely? Jesus can make you whole. You don't have to be trapped in that pain, in that hurt. If a, if a person, it could be a family member or friend that hurts you. I've had people say to me, I've lost all faith in humanity. I mean like every single human on the planet. And it's because they've been hurt. Jesus can make you whole. He can heal that hurt that you've experienced. Some people have hurt because of trials that they've gone through. And they get hurt so badly that they get mad at God. They're like, you must not be a good God. I thought you loved me, God. You don't, you know, why would you let this happen to me in my life? They get hurt. Maybe it's a burden. A trial is temporary. Oftentimes, a burden is something that you just have to carry for the rest of your life. A burden can be a health burden. It literally could be. It could be something that you're never going to get healed from, and you're going to have to live with it for the rest of your life. A burden can be, um, you know, like your marriage ended in divorce maybe, and you're never going to be able to recover that. It's, it's over for good. I mean, like, for good. And that's a burden that you're just going to have to go through life with, knowing that it's never going to get repaired. A trial could be temporary. You look at Job's trial, it lasted for two years and then it ended. But there are some burdens that we're going to carry that are going to be for the rest of our lives. And it, and it hurts. God can make you whole. He can make you whole. There's no trial that you have to go through that you can honestly say, I can't follow Jesus because of this trial. There's no burden that you're going to carry that you can honestly say to God, I, I would follow you, but this burden I'm carrying. And there's no hurt that you could ever feel from a person's behavior that can ever justify you by saying to Jesus, I can't follow you because of what that person did to me. The fact of the matter is, is if you come to Jesus, he can make you whole. And you know why I follow him? Because he has made me whole. I've had plenty of trials. He's made me whole from them. I have a burden. I've had plenty of burdens. i got a heavy, 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 heavy burden that I carry now. But you know why I can still follow Jesus? Because he's made me whole. And there's been people's behavior that has hurt me. But because Jesus has never hurt me, he's made me whole. I can go on. And so can you. Write this down. Letter C. From wounds from wounds. 
Jesus made me whole from my sin. He made me whole from my hurts, and he's made me whole from wounds. What are wounds? Two things, attacks from Satan and self-inflicted problems. Attacks from Satan and self-inflicted problems. Listen this very carefully. If you ever get serious about living for, for the Lord, the devil's coming after you. He just is. He is going to try to cause everything to go wrong in your life. He's going to attack you. He's going to cause you pain. I had someone, oh, who was it? I'm trying to remember who it was yesterday or the day before. I can't remember. Uh, someone said to me, ever since I came to Jesus and got saved, I've had nothing but problems. I can't remember who said that to me just recently, but someone said that to me. And, 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 I, and I said, well, I, you know, kind of welcome to the club. When you get saved, the devil comes after you. He tries to stop you from living for God. And the way he tries to stop you is the fiery darts that he throws at you. The, the, he tries to attack you. He tries to snare you. He tries to tempt you. And sometimes you get wounded by him. You know what Jesus can do? He can make you whole. He's greater than the devil. I love it. In 1 John, it says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you come to Jesus like blind Bartimaeus did, Jesus can make you whole just like he made blind Bartimaeus whole. That means you can be made whole from sin. You can be made whole from hurts, and you can be made whole from wounds. Now, I've talked to you about the attacks of Satan. Now, let's just put this other thing on the table, self-inflicted problems. You know what? You ever heard the expression, I am my own worst enemy? You know, there's sometimes we, we just, we bring the problems onto ourselves. Sometimes we just do things that we're the problem. Why am I in a mess right now? It's because of me. <laughs> and sometimes people have that self-inflicted problem that they feel like, oh, why should I even try? Look at who I am. Look at what I've done. You know, why would Jesus love me? Why would he want me? I guess I'll just give up and quit. And you know what? Jesus can make you whole from that. Sometimes we've done our own damage to our own selves. But if you come to Jesus, he can make you whole. You know what Jesus is a master at? He's a master at taking whatever mess we have and making it nice and beautiful. Whatever your problem is. You say, well, preacher, I've quit on God in the past. Why did you quit? Because me. Well, guess what? Come to him now. <laughs> and he can make you whole. And you never have to quit again. You can recover from that. You don't have to just look at your self-inflicted problems that you brought on yourself and say, I'm useless to God. He doesn't love me anymore. He'll never trust me again. I can never do anything for God. Yes, he can make you whole, just like he did blind Bartimaeus. No matter what you've done in the past, today can be the brand new day. You ever heard the expression, today is the first day of the rest of your life? That's true with Jesus. All of your past can just be a lesson to learn from. But your past does not have to nullify you doing anything for God today. No matter what your past is, you can follow God today if you want. Why is it that I follow Jesus? Because of what he did for me. Well, what did he do for me? Number one, he opened my eyes to the truth, to my purpose in life, and to eternity. What else did he do for me? Because he made me whole. He made me whole from my sin. He made me whole from my hurts. And he made me whole from my wounds. Number three and last, look at Luke 18. Go to Luke chapter number 18. Luke Chapter number 18, and let's look down, if you would please, at verse number 35. Luke chapter 18, we're going to read verse 35 to verse 43. This will be the last passage of the, the sermon, and it'll also be the last point of the sermon. Luke chapter 18. Look down at verse number 35, please. Luke chapter number 18 and verse number 35. The Bible says, And it came to pass 
that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, that he should hold his peace. But he cried, so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, receive thy sight. Here's what he says. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. I said, number one, because Jesus opened my eyes. Number two, because Jesus made me whole. Number three, write this down, because Jesus saved me. Because Jesus saved me. Now, this story in Luke chapter 18 may be a, the same story of blind Bartimaeus. It doesn't say that, though. It doesn't say his name. It may be an entirely different person. But it does say that Jesus didn't say to this man, thy faith hath made thee whole. He says to this man, it says, thy faith hath saved thee. Why is it that I follow Jesus today? Because Jesus saved me. Two applications. Write this down. Letter A, from hell. He saved me from hell. Now, I know a lot of people in the world today, that's not a good enough reason for them to live for God. Do you know why I came to church this morning? Because I follow Jesus. But, 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 but here's why. Because he saved me from hell, and the rest of my life, I'm going to do whatever he wants me to do. Out of gratitude. Do you know why I got baptized after I got saved? Because I was grateful that Jesus saved me. You know, sometimes people have come to the church over these years and I've led them to Christ or someone else led them to Christ and they got saved here at church. And then I explained to them what, you know, about baptism. And, and here's how I usually word it. I say, baptism is symbolic. It doesn't save us. It represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Baptism is like wearing a wedding ring. The wedding ring doesn't make you married. It symbolizes your decision, your vows um, when you did get married. Uh, your vows is what make you married, but the ring represents that. And I said, you calling upon the name of the Lord, that's what caused you to be saved. Baptism is a symbol of that, but here's why I tell people to get baptized. I say you ought to do it out of gratitude because Jesus saved you. And you just simply want to thank him for it. And publicly, this is a public way to express gratitude to Jesus for saving you. And I'm amazed that sometimes people say, no, 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 I'm not going to get baptized. I'm not going to get baptized. There were three different baptisms recorded in the book of Acts. All three types are valid. There was a public baptism, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. 3,000, about 3,000 people got saved, baptized all at the same time at a church service. The second baptism is found in Acts chapter 8. Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. He was just by himself. He had gotten saved, and he said, look, here's water. There was a river nearby. What hinders me from getting baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He goes, I do. He goes, let's do it. They walked. They both together went down into the river. He baptized them. It was a private baptism. The third baptism that's recorded in the book of Acts is the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. At midnight, Paul and Silas were singing and making you know, praises to, and prayed to God, and the, the, the prison doors, the earthquake happened, the prison doors opened, and the jailer came in and was going to kill himself because he said, oh, no, all the prisoners are gone and I'm dead. Back in the Bible days, if you were a jailer and you were in charge of prisoners and they escaped, 
your life was taken. That No questions asked. Doesn't matter how they escaped or why, your life was taken. So he comes in and realizes all oh, the prison doors are open. Oh, surely all the prisoners are gone. He pulled out a sword and Paul yelled out, do thyself no harm. We're all here. Nobody left. And he came into Paul and Silas and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And he got saved. He closed all the prison doors, took Paul and Silas to his home, woke up his wife and kids, and they presented the gospel to his wife and kids. His whole family got saved. And in the middle of the night, they went down to the river and they had a family baptism. Mama bear, Papa bear, and all the baby bears, however many they were. They all got baptized together. So in the Bible, there are three recorded baptisms in the book of Acts. All are valid. There is a public baptism at a church service. There is a private baptism, just the preacher and the, and the convert. And then there's a family baptism. All baptisms are valid. They're all accepted. They're all okay. There's really no excuse for why a person who gets saved refuses to get baptized. Because you can do it one of those three. You can do it with your family. You can do it alone. You can do it in a church service. Now, I prefer to do it in a church service because it encourages other people when they see someone get baptized. It's a blessing to do it during a church service. But the other two are just as valid. But listen, the whole reason a person should get baptized is because they are grateful that Jesus saved them. Now, that's the number one reason why I live for, why I follow Jesus. I'm going, to spend the rest of, I'm going to spend the rest of my life following him because I am just grateful that he saved me from hell. Can you think about that for a minute? Can you imagine right now in your mind yourself burning in hell forever? Just imagine what that must be like. You are in hell. It's black. It's a bottomless pit. That means you're falling forever. How many of you enjoy falling? You ever sit in a chair and you go over backwards, right, to the ground? How do you feel when that happens? I mean, falling, blackness, being alone, no, no presence of God. You crying because of the pain, and then you hear the cries of others in hell. And you're not, you can't see them. There's no consoling each other. You can't go and hug each other. There's no comfort. The Bible says where their worm dieth not and the fire's not quenched. Listen, you, you better get a good dose of reality what hell actually is. That's what is going to happen to every person who's not saved. Now, imagine you feeling all of this pain and experiencing all about hell. And then Jesus reached down and he pulled you out. And he saved you. How do you feel now? You know how I feel? <laughs> Tell me whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I have no problem going to church faithfully. I have no problem burning my dreams and embracing your dreams for me, Jesus. I have no problem with tithing. In fact, let me give more. All these people that have problems with money, you know, giving. I'm like, whatever, dude. I'm just so grateful that Jesus saved me. There's no dollar amount that I could give to him that would bother me. I mean, I'm, I'm his 100% out of gratitude that he saved my soul from hell. How, how do you want me to live? How do you want me to behave? What music do you want me to listen to? Uh, you know, what crowd do you want me to be a part of? How, how do you want me to look and dress? How do you want me to, you know, you, you want me not to drink anymore? You want me not to smoke anymore? You want me not, whatever, man. You just tell me whatever you want. Whatever you want, I'm yours. I am just grateful that you saved my soul from hell. I will follow you for the rest of my life. I don't know how you feel about your salvation, but I am so grateful that he saved me. I will never have to spend a single moment of time in the lake of fire. God is so good. The last thought, because he saved me, letter A, from hell, letter B, from a ruined and wasted life. Write that down. He saved me from a ruined and wasted life. June 10th, 
excuse me, June 15, 1980, Jesus saved me from hell. June 14, 1987, I publicly surrendered my life to Jesus, dedicated my life to him, surrendered to the ministry, and here's the honest, simple truth. He saved me from a ruined and wasted life. What, what does it mean to have a wasted life? Listen carefully. It doesn't mean you just simply go to jail and lose all of your freedom. That obviously would be a wasted life. You don't want to go to jail for the rest of your life. I mean, you just don't. That would be a waste of your life, right? But it doesn't mean just that. What is a wasted life in the sense of the Bible? It means when I get to heaven, not a single thing that I did in my life made an impact for eternity. I have nothing to show for my love for Jesus or living for him. Nothing. Everything in my life mattered nothing for heaven. Now, there are some people that to them, Jesus is just simply fire insurance. That's all he is. I don't have to go to hell. Yay, you're my savior. Okay, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. That means you're going to have a wasted life. I don't want to waste my life. And you know what Jesus did for me in 1987? He saved me from a wasted life. I mean, I actually can make a contribution for heaven, for eternity. I can actually do things that please God. I can actually do things that I can be a benefit to others. Okay, let me give you one more example of a wasted life. You ready for this? A wasted life is a person who lives their entire life self-centered and selfish. They just live for themselves. They just do whatever they do because it makes them feel good or because they want to do it, and they don't do what they don't want to do, and they definitely don't do what doesn't make them feel good. They just, they're self-centered, and everything is about them. That, my friend, is a wasted life. God says, if you, you gain the whole world and lose your soul, and what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And, and, and you, can, you can gain everything for yourself and lose it all when you stand before the Lord. The Bible says, he that seeks his life shall lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. What does that mean? If you live a self-centered, selfish life, you're never going to find it. If you live a life for him, then you will find a life that's worth living. What did Jesus do for me? He saved me from a wasted and ruined life. You know what? I can put my head on my pillow every single night, every single night, and say, you know what? I mattered today. I did something today for eternity. I did something today that pleased God. I made a difference today, somehow, some way. Whenever you follow Jesus and you dedicate your life to him, your life matters. It counts for eternity. I've often lived, I've often said things like this. I thank God that God has allowed me to live a life that's worth living. Whenever you follow Jesus, that is a life that's worth living. You know, some of us, we're going to get to the end of our lives, and a lot of people do this. A lot of people do this. We get to the end of our lives, and we look back on our lives, and we say, what? What do I have to show for my life? We look back at our lives, and we say, what did I actually do in life? I mean, did I just simply exist on this planet? Maybe some people look back on their lives and they say, man, I just caused a lot of people a lot of pain and heartache. I did a lot of bad things. I made a mess of a lot of things. But when I get to the end of my life, I'll never look back on my life and say it was perfect. <laughs> I'll never look back on my life and say I have no regrets. I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. I, I'll never say that. But I can get to the end of my life and look back on it and say I really did make a difference for God. God gave me a life that was worth living. And if you dedicate your life to God, it doesn't mean you're going to be a pastor like I am. I don't want anybody to get all like overly worked up about if I dedicate my life to God, I have to quit my job, I have to move, I have to go to Bible college, I have to you know, become a preacher. No, 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 it's not any of those things. It may be some of those things, but it, may, it, it doesn't need to be any of those things. If you just simply say, Jesus, you saved my soul from hell, would you save me from a wasted life? I want to live for you. Just whatever you want me to do, I'm yours. I just want you to know 
I'm going to live for you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. All the days of my life, I'm yours. And then let Jesus just simply tell you what to do. Tell you how to live. It may be there's some changes that take place. It may be there are no, no significant changes. But instead of just living for the physical, the here and the now and the temporal, now you can live for the eternal. And you can make a difference in people's lives and, and, and for the kingdom of God. Why is it that in all three cases, Matthew 20, Mark 10, and Luke 18, why did those people follow Jesus? It's simply because of what Jesus did for them. And that's okay. I follow him because of what he's done for me. He has opened my eyes. He has made me whole. And he has saved me. Now, how about you? What is it that Jesus has done for you? If you understand all that he's done, maybe that would prompt you and give you reason to follow him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. I sure do love you, dear Lord. I'm so grateful for all.